Welcome, everyone. We'll um, take a couple more, more minutes, I think, uh, just to let people uh, join, and then we'll, um, we'll get going. So, hi everyone. Uh, we have a jam-packed hour ahead of us, uh, so um, I'm going to uh, introduce myself and uh, the fellow speakers and the agenda for today. Uh, my name is Chris Brown. I'm the Commercial Strategy Lead at the Climate Group. Really pleased, delighted to welcome you all for our, um, our webinar today, Connecting the Dots for Clean Energy, for the Clean Energy Transition, Your Buildings, Fleets and the Grid. And we've got an amazing lineup of expert speakers with us today. Um, so I'm gonna very quickly introduce them. I've done myself, so I'm not gonna repeat that, but I'd like to start by introducing Sophie Bordat, Program and Strategy at um, Integrate to Zero, which is a philanthropic initiative focused on scaling integrated uh, energy solutions on sites, on roads, on grids for more rapid emissions reductions and are a value partner of the climate group. We also have Alex Dinker, Global sustain Sustainability Lead, uh, People Experience uh, at Unilever, one of the world's largest consumer goods companies and a long-standing member of our own uh, climate group campaigns, RE100, EV100 and EV100+. Uh, we also have uh, Frank Hetz, uh, Director of Smart Charging at uh, ELAD NL, uh, a Knowledge and Innovation Center in the field of smart charging infrastructure in the Netherlands. And uh, well, it, the list continues. We have Elliot Feldman, Program Manager at Schneider Electric. Welcome El uh, Elliot, and uh, it is early in California, so we really appreciate you being with us. Um, leading the digital uh, automation and energy management, they're leading uh, digital automation and energy management company, and also a valued member of our EV100, RE100 and EP100 initiatives. So welcome to all our speakers. As I say, we have a jam-packed hour ahead. So we're gonna leave a little time for um, a Q&A at the end. So please drop your questions into the Q&A uh, facility on this uh, webinar. Uh, the webinar is being also recorded, so it'll be made available uh, with a link afterwards. But before I hand over to Sophie, uh, I just wanted to give you, uh, and, and for her to share more about the integrated energy topic, I wanted to give you a quick, um, recap on who the climate group are and what we do. Our mission is to drive climate action fast. We focus on systems that have the highest um, emissions and, um, and where we can work with our network of companies, demand side companies and governments uh, to really make uh, opportunities and impacts happen. And they include energy, transport, the built environment and industry. I mentioned governments, we're also Secretariat of the Under Two Coalition, which is the, one of the world's largest networks of states and regions who've all committed to reach net zero by 2050. We also have an amazing international communications team, uh, which we're delighted uh, are there to uh, help promote the thought leadership and impact and, and equally from the work that we're all doing together um, going forward. And we also host these international uh, summits and events. Some of you will be aware of Climate Week NYC, where we bring together businesses, governments and civil society at a time when the UN General Assembly happens. And we're expanding into other areas now with uh, the uh, US, US um, Action Summit. And uh, right now we're about to put on a summit in Southeast Asia, uh, again, bringing people together. So we're really excited with our uh, bringing our networks together and we invite more to join. Enough from me. Let's hand over to Sophie and hear more about integrated energy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sophie Borda from Integrate to Zero, as um, Chris said. I'm very happy to be here. Very excited about the presentations that we'll hear we'll, um, from 
or, or partners here who will bring to life the, the sort of implementation of integrated approach um, through what they're doing. Uh, but before that, I just have two sites to kind of highlight the importance of integrated approaches and um, introduce Integrate to Zero a bit more as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll switch to the next slide. Um, so briefly, um, thanks, Chris, for introducing us. Um, Integrate to Zero, we're a global climate philanthropic initiative. And our focus is very much to scale consumer-centric integrated energy solutions um, on site, on road, on grid for more rapid emissions reductions. We just launched in um, October 2022, so fairly recently. Um, but the kind of the, the reason behind why we exist and why we really see the value of um, doing this now is that we recognize the opportunity today that current technology offers to really accelerate decarbonization strategies. Um, we've now got the cost of uh, renewables really going down, batteries going down, EVs um, joining that as well. And um, the fact that all of these kind of assets can be plugged in together um, not only can reduce sort of the operating costs for businesses and the energy costs for businesses, but offer supplements sort of support the grid with greater flexibility, services can also generate um, kind of greater energy security resilience for any, any um, consumer, uh, energy consumer and end user. Um, and uh, drive emissions down uh, more quickly um, instead of just trying to implement individual individual assets one after the other. Um, so we we really recognize kind of where the market is now and and how um, it needs to be pushed even further to drive rapid emissions and everyone can participate in sort of, adopting an integrated solutions and rather than just becoming being a consumer becoming a prosumer and a real active sort of um agent in this space um but we also recognize sort of the the kind of the lack of awareness and maybe understanding of what an integrated approach means what the value is whether that's for a business whether that's for um, policy network operators and and what sort of business models are out there um, and what are the ways to approach this so that's where we kind of come in and and really want to complement in in this space um but in terms of i think the, the the kind of introduction points to the discussion and what we're seeing in terms of and what is getting us excited of what's happening in this space is that um one of the areas that we focus on is um supporting developing markets and adopting these solutions and we're seeing that the technologies are available in in most regions and that systems can be deployed very quickly for example in rwanda we're supporting a deployment for one of the of the biggest um supermarket chains and we've seen we've been able to implement this within three months the second point is um really in terms of the, the value of in adopting these distributed and integrated assets um, from some kind of modeling we've conducted and case studies that we're seeing, um, savings can be up to 20 to 60% on energy cost in different geographies and paybacks are now can be as low as two to seven years by having these um, solutions. Um, it also brings greater, I think I've touched on micro sort of level benefits of these um, systems when we operate them in a dynamic and integrated way, these savings can be captured by sort of grid and at a, at a, at a national level. And um, our partners, Cornwall Insight, have looked at this and um, having an integrated approach versus a fit and forget can generate up to 13 billion pound savings in one year. The market is moving very quickly and we're seeing new players in this space. So, um, you know, EV manufacturers are now also offering solar panels, battery storage, EV chargers. Um, so it is a, a very kind of competitive and growing space. 
But my last point before I hand over to Alex, and I think to introduce this conversation is that um, we're seeing, you know, great leaders, and we're going to hear from them now, um, that are having more sort of integrated approaches and breaking the silos that we're seeing in terms of decarbonizing transport um, on one side, then um, sites operations and so on. Um, but there is still a, a, a kind of a, a lack of action onto that. And I think there might be several barriers to that. Um, but just something to think about um, as we hear from our, our speakers today, um, how can we actually break these shadows to um, to move more quickly? Um, so I will now hand over to um, Alex from Unilever. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a true pleasure to stand before such a diverse group of visionaries and change makers. I'm going to dive into our Unilever Climate Action Plans discuss our sustainability goals, progress in our integrated energy systems approach, the major projects in, in this area, challenges and success enablers, and share some valuable insights we've gathered along the way that I hope all of us can benefit from. When we uh, look at, at our targets, Unilever has short, medium and long-term climate targets that span both our operations and our wider value chain. These and the roadmap for meeting them are set out in our 2021 Climate Transition Action Plan, backed by an overwhelming 99% of shareholders in our AGM. Today, I will primarily focus on strategies for curbing operational emissions, which account for around 2% of the emissions within the scope of our net zero targets. I'll unpack our work around renewable energy generation, efficient energy use, the energy storage plans that we have, and the essential collaborations that are accelerating our efforts towards our net zero target. At Unilever, our integrated energy systems approach ensures that every part of the energy production, the transfer of energy and its usage is or will be synergized in a mutually beneficial cycle. I call it an orchestra of sustainable operations, synchronizing energy production from renewable sources optimizing storage systems and implementing energy efficient practices across our global facilities. With cutting edge technologies and innovative strategies, we've reduced our energy cost and emissions, improved our resilience, and we also drive progress towards achieving our ambitious net zero targets. Just to give you a few numbers as well. So since 2015, we've reduced our operational emissions by a noteworthy 68% mostly driven by our transition to clean energy sources, primarily our switch to renewable electricity. Having switched to 100% renewable grid electricity by 2020, our gaze is now fixed on achieving our RE100 target for all our electricity use worldwide, according to the RE100 best practice criteria, and to also switch 100% our renewable thermal energy by 2030. According to our annual report last year, 93% of our electricity use and over a third of our heat came from renewable sources. We also reduced the CO2 emissions from energy per ton of production by 79% since our baseline year 2008, down by 11% in the last year. Beyond this, we are also one of the first companies to sign up on the EV100 initiative, pledging to transition our car fleet to EVs by 2030, with some cars already being charged in locations powered by renewable energy, contributing to the wider global movement towards clean transportation. Our global locations are shining beacons of renewable energy implementation. So let's take a quick journey around the world to see this in action. Our office in Englewood Cliffs, USA, is a LEED Platinum certified building, which means that it has been designed and constructed to be energy efficient and environmentally sustainable. The building is a has a green rooftop that absorbs rainwater, reducing the stormwater runoff and lowering the building cooling needs. It's using uh, energy efficient lighting and heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems, the HVAC systems, as well as mo motion control sensors, especially to reduce energy consumption in spaces of the building that are not in use. 
It has a rooftop solar PV system that partially covers the building electricity demand and also supplies some of the electricity used by the charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Our factories in Tianjin, China, in Dayatuba, Brazil, and Dapada in India are recognized by the, um, by the um, WEF as lighthouse factories. And just to give you a, a few more details on each of these factories, Tianjin uses electricity from wind, water, biomass, solar, and geothermal sources controlled via a smart management system, which has reduced electricity consumption by a third and lowered emission by 17%. In Dayatuba, the largest laundry powder factory in the world has switched to sustainably, sustainably sourced biomass to generate its own heat and uses machine learning to improve thermal efficiency together these uh, are reducing the emissions being generated from owned or control sources by over 98%. And we also lowered our energy losses and costs by more than 50%. And the latest uh, World Economic Forum Lighthouse Factory, Dapada in India, uses machine learning um, and integrated energy management systems to drive energy optimization and digital twin technology to accelerate the processes around formulations, Collectively, all of this reducing energy consumption by almost a third and emissions by 28%. Apart from these initiatives, um, I've also mentioned earlier that we've, we've taken a pledge to transition our vehicles uh, to 100% um, to EVs by 2030 as part of the EV100 commitment. But alongside this switch, we've also deployed charging infrastructure in our offices and R&D centers, such as the Englewood Cliffs office I just mentioned in the US, Wageningen in Netherlands, in Barcelona, in Rome, just to name a few others. And of course, last year, we took the further step of signing up to EV100+, Plus, where alongside our EV100+, Plus partners, we'll be sending a strong, powerful signal to governments, manufacturers, and the wider industry that the future of global medium and heavy duty vehicles is electric, and we hope to inspire other companies to join us. Our sustainability plans encompass broad areas, including storage and renewable heat generation. We envisage the, the creation of circular energy factories where heat is no longer just a byproduct, but a valuable resource, and therefore reducing our rely, reliance on external heat supplies. So far, we've developed the know-how um, for capitalizing on almost all types of waste heat from our processes and utilities. And now we're actively working with factories to develop fully integrated energy systems that also include renewable energy solutions such as solar or geothermal. Heat recovery combined with a heat pump supported by an electric boiler or solar thermal is the approach that, that we favor for our factories. At Unilever, we make products in batches. Our demand for heat goes up certain points in the production cycle and then it stops, meaning that heat demand regularly fluctuates, right? So the combination of these technologies are a proven and reliable solution which can really provide this uninterrupted heat uh, supply. We have trialed this uh, solution with heat pumps and existing solar thermal systems in one of our personal care factories in Dubai, uh, just to provide this energy boost during the night when obviously the sun doesn't shine. And this resulted in a further 16% re reduction in gas consumption. So we're keen to keep experimenting with the idea of combining heat pumps with other technologies. And when it comes to electric vehicles and our commitments for the EV100 and EV100 plus, we really need to have EV cars and EV trucks to come to the markets so that we can deliver on these commitments. But we also need the global charging infrastructure and global access to renewable power. In the face of technical, financial, and regulatory challenges, we've innovatively turned adversity into opportunity. Key success drivers that we've, uh, we've found include robust internal coordination between different departments and business, um, 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 and, and business uh, partners um, around, the, around the globe, uh, also the supportive governmental policies access to green finance, fruitful partnerships, and relentless technological innovation. Each of these elements represents a piece of a puzzle, right? When we put these pieces together, 
they will, will accelerate the deployment of, uh, of the integrated clean energy systems and pave the way to this clean energy future for, for all of us. Now, just looking back um, on a decade of Unilever Sustainable Living Plan and now our, our current Compass business strategy, we are demonstrating that sustainability and business growth can go hand in hand. So we extend an invitation to everyone to join us in this mission, uh, harnessing this collective creativity and technological advancements to address climate change. Um, but also remember that this deployment of integrated energy systems doesn't happen overnight. It requires a clear goal setting, a, a thorough energy audit, and carefully considered, considered technology uh, solutions and choices, collaborations, very importantly, and constant monitoring and optimization to ensure success. This is our journey to a sustainable future and we invite you to join us on this rewarding expedition. And with my final slide, I just want to, to highlight that in the face of our energy challenges, let's really remember the, uh, the wisdom of Nelson Mandela. It's always impossible until it's done. So together we can turn this impossible into reality harnessing the power of integrated energy systems to create a sustainable and resilient future for all of us. It's a significant task, but we have the terminology, we have the technology, we have the strategies and the determination to make it happen. So remember every energy transition begins with a simple, sim single step and that step starts with us. So thank you very much and over to you, Frank. Thank you, Alex, um, uh, for your presentation, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to present here. Um, and I'm going to talk mainly about electric vehicles um, uh, in the Netherlands, but oh, I have to use the other one, sorry. Um, we have a quite an international public, um, so I thought um, I can bore you a lot with the numbers that we have in Europe regarding electric vehicles, but you can look up themselves as well on the website that is uh, above. But I think what's interesting is that in Europe, we have uh, of passenger cars, 286 million, of which uh, currently over 15 million are um, zero emission. Uh, and in April of this year, one fifth of new uh, passenger cars were uh, connected with a plug. So we definitely have started and there is a lot of more numbers uh, to be found on this website if you're interested. Um, and as you might know, in Europe, uh, the Netherlands is one of the front runners uh, with electric mobility. Uh, and we, when we talk about electric mobility, it's about getting the car electric, but then a new challenge is how to charge your car. Um, and that's different as you do with your combustion engine. Um, I was told nobody's hobby is to drive to a fuel station. Um, so I think when we drive electric, an electric car is uh, nicer to drive, is uh, more silent. So I think even charging should also be a better experience. Uh, and we have been advocating a lot for uh, smart charging to get um, not only um, the benefit of the car, but also a benefit when charging your car. Uh, and that's what we call smart charging. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have quite a number of charge stations. Uh, and we're also uh, struggling like the rest of the world with how to integrate those huge amount of electric cars charging on the existing electricity grid. Uh, and we have been pioneering in, uh, in this area and we made a report of uh, the pilots uh, that have been going on in the Netherlands regarding smart charging in the period 2015 and 2020. Uh, and as you can see in this picture, there are quite a lot of them. And if to have, I have to summarize these, uh, these pilots, they all engage mainly with the, the techno uh, technology of getting that ready uh, and, um, and make it workable. Uh, but since 2020, uh, more has happened. And I think we are now in the phase of application of the technology. And I took three examples that are uh, running now um, that show that smart charging or charging um, is uh, a, a big opportunity for businesses, for consumers, uh, and for the integration in the, in, the, uh, in the power grid. On the right bottom, 
you see uh, MRA Electris. Uh, and this is a, uh, a project or basically a, a scale up in the, the northern part of the Netherlands, uh, where we have uh, 10,000 public charge stations and thousands of them are now um, applied with a smart charging algorithm that charges your car based on the available solar panel or uh, wind energy. Um, that means that sometimes your car is uh, charged faster uh, and other times it's uh, charged a bit slower depending on the weather. Um, and the weather goes hand in hand with price in this time, because usually when there is a lot of solar energy, the electricity prices go down. So your car is not only charged more with more renewables, but also cheaper. So that's, I think, best of, uh, of both worlds. Um, another example is on the, on the left side. It's the, the ANWB, which is um, a, a large organization in the Netherlands um, with uh, road assistance. For, for cars with 5 million members. Um, and well, they do a couple of things uh, and they also entered the market for uh, charging your car. Uh, they did that in the beginning with an uh, RFID pass, which you could use to charge in any charge point in the Netherlands or Europe. But now they are also entered the market of delivering electricity. Uh, and they do that based on dynamic prices. So you get a different price for your electricity purchase uh, every hour. Uh, and a smart algorithm uh, determines the best time to charge your car to save cost. This can be done typically at a private home. Uh, and they calculate it with dynamic prices. You could save uh, up to uh, several hundred euros a year in your electricity costs. And this is being rolled out uh, and provided commercially already. And actually, they had to do a, a temporary customer stop due to the success of uh, several ten thousands of, uh, of new customers. Um, so this proof, proves that uh, smart charging is already uh, having a solid business case. Then uh, the top one, uh, I think that's the most interesting, uh, given the topic of this, um, this webinar. Uh, this is um, uh, an area, a city in the Netherlands called Utrecht a part of a, a European project called Scale. And here they have truly integrated several uh, parts of the new energy system. Uh, in Utrecht, they have started with the installation of over 10,000 solar panels, uh, mainly on schools, uh, which, in which they generate a lot of local uh, renewable energy. And they were wondering where to use it, uh, and they used it to charge electric cars. So they rolled out a large network of charging stations. Um, but at the same time, they introduced um, a, a shared car program. So you can use your energy with the, your private car, but you can also use shared cars. Um, and they now have a fleet of almost 200 electric shared cars, which are being charged based on the renewable energy that is being produced with the 10,000 solar panels. Uh, and this makes an interesting business case because now you can also make money with a car when it's standing still. And especially for fleet operators, this is an, uh, an extra uh, possibility to make money with a car uh, with a large battery. Um, and even more so, um, they last week, uh, um, some ministries uh, in the Netherlands visited uh, Utrecht where a new residential area is being uh, built. Um, and in that residential area, the number of parking places is reduced um, and the shared the car program is there set um, as the main uh, means of mobility for the new residents that are going to live there. And of course, there's also solar panels. So, so they, they're really on a uh, city area are looking how to integrate different parts of the electricity system. Uh, we are expanding that in the whole of Utrecht but actually uh, to uh, the region of Utrecht and, and hopefully also the Netherlands and Europe following after. Um, also interesting in this pilot is that uh, there is also a fleet of uh, currently 25 bidirectional char cars. Um, so they not only are charged, but they can also deliver back to the energy system um, depending on, on the business model, model you want to use. So these are examples that are being uh, happening in the Netherlands right now. 
Uh, at the same time, we are expanding uh, together with uh, the ministries of, uh, in the Netherlands of infrastructure and energy of rolling out smart charging in the whole of the Netherlands. Uh, and the ambition is that 60%, 60% of all charging sessions at the end of 2025, so that's uh, in over two to three years, are smart charged. Um, and currently we are on a percentage of less than 5%. So we are really hoping to leap forward uh, with this program and roll out nationwide smart charging. Um, and I think the setting up of this program is, uh, is of interest because it costs quite hard on how to, uh, to structure this. And on the right, you see some design principles. And I think that's crucial in, in getting forward. Uh, what we did is that charging is a free market. So the main action is that we trust the stakeholders on the power and creativity um, to make ch charging of electric vehicles happen. At the same time, we want to protect the users. Um, and in this uh, program, which is a nation program, we found it important that we are business model and technology agnostic. So give the market the possibility to come with new models uh, and an entrepreneur, but also have uniformity where necessary. Uh, it still bothers me that when you uh, travel through Europe, that it's not possible to charge your car with just one RFID pass or with one bank pass. So you need uniformity to lower any barriers for a user to, to step over to electric cars. Uh, in this program, we focus on what is possible and good is good enough. So it can always be better, but let's, let's just start. That's the uh, one main part of the goal of this program. Um, and we have to balance several interests. Um, so it's also seen it as a learning uh, project in the coming years to the, the real scale up after 2025. Uh, in essence, this uh, program focuses on the demand side of uh, charging, uh, but also accelerating the supply uh, part of smart charging. Um, and I think the proposition is that with smart charging, you can charge cheaper with more renewables and also make sure the security of supply or what we call power free Grantly. The car target locations are home and at work because that is where your car is usually parked of, uh, for 20 hours a day. And then we have in, uh, uh, identified several target groups and you probably have read them. And I think for the people that are listening to this uh, webinar, you can recognize the, in one of the other groups and you see there's always a benefit, benefit for you of, of doing smart charging. Um, I think I'll leave this one. Uh, the, the slides will be sent uh, out afterwards because this is getting in more in detail how we think we can uh, balancing the stakeholder interests uh, or we can take it up in, in the Q&A, but I don't want to make uh, take more time than necessary for this presentation. So I'll round up here and give the word to, um, to Elliot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Frank. That was great. And uh, thanks again to the climate group for uh, allowing me to present today. So I am going to start off with just a little bit more information about uh, Schneider Electric, as you may not be familiar with our company. Uh, Schneider is a global leader in all aspects of energy management. And you know we're really proud to say that we've been ranked uh, one of the most sustainable companies when it comes to our own manufacturing footprint. Uh, we're really focused on, on helping our clients uh, manage uh, their energy resources uh, to accelerate sustainability and decarbonization for all. And you know one of our core focuses at the moment right now is, is to really accelerate that uh, from ambition uh, over to impact. Uh, as you probably know, though, it's easier said than, than done. And uh, an interesting quote that I recently came across was that um, we surveyed our, our clients and in 2022, only 12% of Fortune 500 companies felt like they were making progress towards their sustainability goals. And so, you know, having interacted with so many people across the globe and, and hearing these challenges, we really do agree with the concept uh, that an integrated approach is the uh, best way to go out and to make this a reality. 
Uh, for my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on uh, a really exciting project that we did within our public sector group. And I, I think that's an important uh, thing to really camp out on because if, if our governments, you know, at the federal level here in U the USA or even at the down to the local level are not laying the groundwork for sustainability, uh, it's going to be really hard for uh, the private sector and for even consumers at home to go out and, and make this commitment towards sustainability. So to just start with kind of the, the macro view, they're, they're, we're at a really critical point here. And on one side of the equation, we are seeing firsthand the impacts of climate change. Uh, you know, folks all around the world that we're speaking with are, are talking about disruptions to their operations because of severe weather, uh, heat, flooding, really everything is, is impacting uh, the globe. But uh, of recent, and uh, you all in Europe understand this, I think, much more than, than we do in the U.S., but there has been an energy crisis. And so where many folks went down the path of uh, having these ambitious sustainability targets, they've had to kind of uh, reduce those and refocus their priorities on uh, energy security, resiliency, and really cost management. Um, and so we, we understand that challenge. We, we know balancing those two can be really hard. But what also is challenging is, is adding into the, you know, the equation a, a level of financial uncertainty, um, whether that's, uh, you know, something we're seeing here with political discord or the volatile interest rates. Um, and as a result of all that, maybe a potential looming recession or already being in a recession, uh, you know, companies and, and organizations all around the world are having to, to pause and to recalibrate their investments. Uh, right now, uh, and I think rightfully so, they're, they're thinking quarter by quarter instead of going back to the 20 and 30 and 2040 targets. The good news with all that being said is that energy is a critical component uh, that can help navigate through all these challenges uh, and really come out successful on the other end. So let's go ahead and take uh, the state of California, which I currently uh, live in, at, at, as an example. Just to give everyone uh, a little bit more information, uh, if you don't have the details on California, uh, California is the largest and wealthiest state in the United States uh, in terms of population and GDP. Uh, population is roughly the size of Poland and has an economy uh, comparable to that of Germany. But what we're seeing uh, in, in California, and this is you know, starting at the, the grid level and working its way all the way down, is really uh, the impacts of climate challenges, uh, as well as an outdated uh, infrastructure. So you know, the drought has caused uh, reduction in hydropower capacity. Uh, it has caused more wildfires. And utilities have, you know, been trying to manage that and, and making major investments into undergrounding their infrastructure, while also trying to you know, incorporate really progressive uh, sustainability requirements like the integration of new renewables, solar and wind, battery storage, and then a really large uh, and, and upcoming uh, integration of EVs. And you know, these are all unique challenges and uh, we do applaud the, the local and, and state government for investing in the right direction here in California. Uh, but, you know, just tying it back to some of the themes that we're discussing as a group, we feel again that this integrated approach that looks at all of this comprehensively uh, from policymakers to grid operators to large building users, public and private sector, getting everyone to the table and understanding the best path forward and creating a plan from there is, is, is how we're going to go out and, again, uh, accomplish all of the goals that we need to. And so, I, you know, I've talked now twice about this integrated approach, and, and I thought it'd be good to kind of provide an overview of exactly what that looks like. 
And one of the first things that we as Schneider have found is, is critical to enabling the integrated approach is, is really conducting a workshop with all levels of stakeholder at the organization. Uh, and that must include uh, leadership at the top, but also many of the day-to-day -day users and the um, folks conducting the operations. And in that workshop, you know, we need to establish where you are currently and what your growths are. And once we know that growth target, we can create a, you know, a kind of a strategy to help guide that sustainability initiative. And again, we, we think of that as that, that master plan. From there, we need to establish a benchmark analyzing your everything from your utility usage to your current carbon emissions and, and project out where you're going to be in moving forward. And then again, re-engaging with all those stakeholders, ensuring leadership is, is on board and it's being passed down to the, uh, the folks all throughout the organization. We can turn that strategy or that idea uh, really into action. And you know, we utilize a, a data specific platform to, to track all the different scope emissions. We can implement projects uh, to improve energy efficiency and integrate renewables. And really it's a continuous effort that's highly collaborative that tracks the performance over a time uh, to implement the goals of a sustainability initiative. And I'm gonna talk uh, next a little bit about a really exciting uh, story and project that I was uh, fortunate to lead with Modesto City Schools. So just to, to paint the picture a little bit more, Modesto, California is a uh, historically rural disadvantaged community located in Central California where most of the agriculture for the United States is produced. And, you know, historically, they have not really been too interested in sustainability. However, uh, demographics have changed. The school district's board and leadership really started to uh, want to see more improvements from everything from the environment and renewable energy and, and just, you know, again, the sort of catch all of sustainability. But we came in actually to start helping them with a large electric school bus project. They gave us a ring and said, hey, you know, believe it or not, we think we're going to get a lot of incentive and funding and we're about to buy 30 electric school buses. And that was the single largest order of Bluebird electric school buses uh, so far. And so, you know, we started working with them to, to craft designs and ideas around uh, an integrated uh, charging uh, infrastructure. So a mix of you know, level two and level three charging, uh, solar carports to offset their electricity costs and provide shade under the electric school buses. Uh, and also to think you know, long-term about you know, what are the options for V to G, what is an expanded fast charging network look like throughout the city. And you know, from those conversations, they were able to see, oh, you know, Schneider Electric is a really a great partner in, in able to look holistically at sustainability throughout our, uh, our district operations. And so we were able to grow the program and we have uh, gone on to build regular solar carports at some of their high schools. And something we're extremely proud about is we worked with the, uh, essentially the curriculum side of the house, the superintendent, business and facilities and we were able to implement uh, six um, really great solar powered outdoor learning environments. There's kind of a, a rendering here on the, the screen to give you an illustration of what that looks like. They're in construction right now, uh, but providing a learning atmosphere uh, and a you know, unique, completely sustainable um, place for students to go about their, their day and take classes outside, have their lunch in their, um, and, and you know, teach them about, about STEM and sustainability. So we're really proud of that. That's, that's one of a kind. And again, we, by taking this integrated approach and really engaging with all stakeholders, we've gone out to help Modesto City Schools and, and help them become one of the most sustainable school districts in all of California. Um, this integrated approach also resulted in, you know, net savings of over 
quarter million dollars per year that they are reinvesting back in their, to their district for even more energy cost savings and, and other great curriculum. So overall, we thought that was just, you know, a really great story that kind of encapsulates how Schneider Electric helps, where our clients are trying to go. And, you know, again, turning that uh, idea really into impact and, and through an integrated approach. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And I, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, um, Elliot. Hi, everyone. So I'm Katie. I'm Program Innovation Manager at Climate Group. Um, I'm just going to pop on here now to help facilitate the, the Q&A that we're going to run. Um, I think probably to kick things off, um, Elliot, I might actually just follow up with you on a couple of uh, the points that you raised. Um, I think when you were mentioning maybe the workshops that you run with clients at the beginning of thinking about how you might implement an integrated energy approach and strategy, you talked about how it's important bringing in, you know, different stakeholders. And I was just wondering what, how, how much does a siloed organizational structure kind of affect that engagement? How much you overcome that? Um, and is integrated energy approaches, kind of the benefits of that widely understood um, across all those different functions maybe within a business? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, we would not be able to have had such success at Modesto City Schools without their leadership and without their willingness to just get all stakeholders to the table earlier. Obviously, we've all worked with a lot of organizations and when it is viewed through each individual silo, it's hard to integrate them together and, and bring bigger levels of change and more programmatic effort. Um, and the last thing I'll say is what's really interesting to me, and you know, as Frank and other folks talk about integration of EVs, it's kind of the first time where you know your your infrastructure for your transportation is now located on your facilities. So you're having folks that don't necessarily talk all the time work together and Modesto City Schools example is having the transportation director at the table to talk with the, the CFO and, and really have that direct line of communication where they were kind of typically going about doing their own thing. So I think it's really critical and, and a very important first step. Yeah, that's that's great. And I think as well, um, Alex, you touched on that a little bit as well as one of the, the kind of learnings is that bringing together um, a, across uh, your your business functions and units. I mean, Unilever is is huge, has a massive footprint. And maybe a question to you then around that. Unilever has large financial resources. California, we've been hearing from Elliot, is a wealthy state. Um, maybe a question around, is it really only possible right now for those sort of cash-rich businesses and states to explore and implement integrated energy approaches um, maybe what kind of cap upfront capital investment is needed? Thank you, thank you, Katie. Well, indeed, integrated energy systems, clean energy systems require a, a heavy upfront cost, right? But as, as I've also uh, broken down during my presentation, the different layers of, of what an integrated energy system uh, represents when we start with energy efficiency, when we, when we look at uh, sourcing our energy from on-site or off-site renewable energy sources. Um, those are actually segments of um, an integrated system that can be attacked um, at the beginning by most organizations that do not have the necessary upfront costs for um, storage or large uh, renewable energy systems or large assets, right? Now, there are also additional support mechanisms when we think about financing mechanisms such as green bonds or green leases, um, public or private partnerships uh, can, can overcome this barrier, can help companies overcome this barrier uh, when we step into the large end-to-end um, um, integrated clean energy systems, right? So my advice is really to start with the low hanging fruits and the quick return on investment, energy efficiency and, and sourcing and, uh, and move towards integrated solutions 
with the financial mechanisms available. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, that's um, that's really answered my question. So thank you. We've had a really great question from Mike in the chat, and I'll just remind everyone: if you do have questions, please do use the Q and A. Um, so it, it is to you, Frank, and actually it, it links to a question that I also had to you around, you know, the the role of policy. And we've recently seen California has mandated bidirectional charging um, by 2027. Um, Mike's asked that you've referred to being technology agnostic in terms of rolling out EV charging infrastructure. Um, but what is the wider view in the Netherlands relating to that wider technology um, agnosticism? For example, setting a zero tailpipe emissions goal or trajectory and allowing the vehicle manufacturers to determine the solutions. In Germany, we know the car industry is suggesting biofuels as a part of the transition. So yeah, any, any thoughts and reflections um, on that would be great to hear. Yeah, uh, so, so good question. Um, uh, basically two questions. <laughs> uh, so what about uh, zero emission not being electric uh, cars? Um, so good to, to mention is that uh, my background is of a grid operator. Uh, ELAT is actually a foundation of the Dutch grid operators, both DSO and PSO. Uh, so our focus is therefore on electricity. Uh, but there are indeed other solutions uh, possible in getting zero emission. Um, and in principle, I would say, uh, as long as we get zero emission, and then I mean true zero emission, uh, I would favor any technology that achieves that. But my understanding of the market is that uh, currently battery technology is the, the most promising one um, regarding uh, definitely passenger cars, but also regarding uh, trucks and buses. Um, so there is more than just the technology. I think there are many forces at, uh, uh, being in place that determine which technology uh, wins or is being uh, uh, pursued. Um, Regarding then uh, limiting it again to electric, um, your bidirectional uh, or V2G question, uh, I think it's important to understand, first of all, that charging your car uh, can make uh, the, the choosing that uh, wisely and smartly uh, benefits you in the first place in, in several ways. So for an integrated system, I think everybody understands, even your uh, mother-in-law, if you have solar panels on your rooftop, and you have an electric car in front of your house, it does make sense to charge your car with your own solar panels. Everybody understands that. Um, and I think we should make it that simple. So charging your car uh, at the right moment, and you cho choose what's right, whether you have your own solar panels or that you have uh, cheap energy, that does make sense given the fact that the car is standing parked over 20 hours a day, either at home or at work. So I think even at work, there is a lot of opportunity to do uh, smart charging and charging your car at, uh, at smart moments. And um, the V2G, I think, would be a, a great addition to that um, uh, because then you can harvest your solar energy during the day and reuse it at the end of the day or in the night. But especially for fleet owners, I think there are huge opportunities in, um, in V2X uh, uh, cars. So imagine you have a, a car rental with literally hundreds of thousands of cars. If they would all be bidirectional and you can manage them aggregated, um, you can really make a difference in balancing the energy in the, in the energy system. And there is a business model for that. So you can earn money. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, California mandated this and to be honest, I personally hope that we will do the, the same in Europe um, and create this market. Great, thank you for answering two questions so um, eloquently. Um, okay, then another another question um, for you, Alex, around the fact that Unilever has such an array of different sites um, and how, you know, do you need to take different approaches um, whether it's a corporate office, whether it's a manufacturing logistics site, I guess, regionally, um, and, and how you go about taking those sorts of approaches. Thank you, Katie. Yes, indeed, it's, it's quite a very um, interesting approach, right, where, where um, the, the geography span and the type of um, uh, sites that we have in our portfolio is, is, is basically 
polarized uh, from, from offices to factories, warehouses, R&D centers, data centers, et cetera, right? So to answer, to answer your question, absolutely. The, the approach should be completely different between an office versus a manufacturing site or a logistics site. But the, because the, the main difference lie in the actual energy consumption patterns, the nature and the scale of operations and the specific opportunities that we have for energy efficiency and, and renewable energy utilization, right? Um, you've heard me earlier mention about um, a few examples of our office in, in the US um, having, having this, uh, this lead certification, right? Looking at the different types of energy efficiencies that we've uh, implemented there, the way we build the office, but also how we uh, harness the, the different elements uh, like, like the rainwater or the, the solar power and then use, use those in our um, office operation. Now, in a factory, uh, this is a bit different, right? Because the factory runs 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week in most cases. And, um, and that requires uh, an intermittent, uh, 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 a continuous uh, flow of, of energy, right? So um the the way we scale and the way we implement solutions um, is obviously in line with the demand and the supply right there are some similarities though uh, when it comes to the way we apply um, these solutions so the fact that uh, we have such a large portfolio also allows us to 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 make benefit of the scale of our operations right so when we look for partnerships when we um, when we are part of industrial parks, we always look for scaling up our solutions and, and uh, moving away from silos, uh, not only looking at manufacturing or just an office or an R&D or a warehouse, but actually combining the solutions together in, in um, partnerships that uh, will ensure a future fit solution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Apologies for the echo. I think, yeah, that should be sorted. Um, uh, maybe a quick one, and I, actually it's probably something that everyone might be able to just answer quickly here now is, I mean, I was gonna say if you had, maybe I, I've got a good one here actually. It's about the terminologies being used because we hear so much um, different ways of describing um, this topic. Um, maybe a bit of jargon, um, and that can mean it's quite inaccessible sometimes or difficult to engage with. And I wondered if this is something that any of you have experienced. Um, maybe we can start with you, Elliot, in terms of that, that engagement with your customers and clients, um, and whether you see a mix of language in terms of being a barrier, as something that we need to overcome. Yeah, I was laughing to myself because uh, at trade shows, folks always come up to us and says, do you do solar? And so if we just called all of this solar, I think it, there wouldn't be any confusion on terminology. But uh, yeah, it, it is, I think, important when we talk about clean energy, sustainable energy, you know, energy efficiency, it all has its place. But standardizing kind of that naming structure I think would be a, a net positive, but it, it also just demonstrates our role is that because this transition is so big, it's new and it's it's so important, we have to really take the time to explain it and find out the right words to use to have each person we're speaking with understand it in their world. And, and if we don't connect those dots, we don't advance these broader initiatives that we're all trying to do. Yeah, that make, makes sense. I don't know if Alex or Frank, if you've got any views on that as well, anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add a few things here because it's super important that any anything that we use and the jargon that we use in, in the space of sustainability, energy and integrated solutions has to be simplified. We have to use visual tools and, and really use the initiatives for educating the stakeholders, engage with the stakeholders and and really collaborate in, in, with other companies in forums such as this, the RE100, EV100, EV100+, to really have the same common language so that, that we can land the, the right messages. 
Brilliant. Um, so we're going to start wrapping up now, but if I can just ask you all, um, and we'll go around, we'll start with you, Frank, if there's one key action from today that you want, um, you know, lis listeners on this webinar uh, to, to pursue, what would that be? Uh, I think it's a start. Uh, if I look at the Netherlands, uh, and I know it's different in different countries, but we have uh, uh, a large, uh, wide variety of brands, cars being uh, available on the market. Uh, and actually, my employer has just stated that uh, as of the 1st of July, they are only allowing full electric uh, battery electric vehicles um, uh, being bought or being leased. Uh, and I think that's what we need. I need we, need. we need to create demand and we can do that together. I think the technology is there. If we push supply, uh, that greatly helps. And let me give me one small example, which I like very much of Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam taxis, they try to electrify them. Uh, and they had a subsidy for that, for the car, uh, the taxi drivers to buy an electric car. And after a couple of years, they changed the, the subsidy model because they went to the hotels and restaurants and they said, well, do you want to be sustainable? So the next time you call a cab for your customers, uh, order an electric one. And in that way, uh, taxi drivers were encouraged by the customers to get an electric car. And it didn't cost anything to restaurants or hotels, but the demand was created and then the market starts working. So create demand. That would be my uh, my call to action. Thanks, Frank. Um, Alex, just a quick one. We're, we're running over time. Key takeaway. The, the true potential of clean energy integrated systems can only be achieved through collaboration and partnerships. Fantastic. And Elliot, final reflections? Uh, just personally, that EV fleets are, are something that's really important, uh, going to continue to evolve quickly in, in an integrated approach between grids, buildings, users, and the fleets themselves uh, is paramount to success in all this. Fantastic. Well, we'll wrap up now. Can't thank you enough, everyone, for your uh, participation, those who are online listening in for your questions and your feedback. Um, we'll be sharing the recording and the slides with you um, as a follow up. And yes, thank you, Alex, Frank, Elliot, Sophie, Chris, um, for presenting today. And have a good rest of your days. Thank you so much. <laughs>